Welcome to Michael's Microtonal Method, Episode 1. So, there's a point to calling a note or tone a microtone when it is in relation to some other type of tone. Our most familiar tones are whole tones and semitones, where the size of two semitones is pretty much the size of one whole tone. Now there's other ways to look at tones. You know, we can split them up in different ways and this has been done over the millennia. Now we're not going to go into this ancient history or into comparative cultural history because in Western music is where the French horn sits. So we'll just stay within that realm, in the main, all right? So this episode is about the framework of pitches in relation to the harmonics played on the horn. Now look, I'm not going to go into details about acoustics, but we'll provide the caveat that the harmonics played on the horn, or an inst instrument, any instrument, have a relation to true harmonic series sometimes very close relations, but the played harmonics may not be perfectly true. Each instrument is slightly different. Do look up acoustics in the University of New South Wales website if this is of interest to you. Now, harmonics 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 and 8, 8 to 16, give an octave. There are other ones, aren't there? If you use harmonics 3 to 6, 6 to 12, 5 to 10, these also are octaves. In tuning theory, an octave is called the ratio 1 to 2, or 2 to 1, whether it's between harmonics 1 and 2, or 6 and 12, it makes no difference. The ratio is the same. Octave is ratio 1 to 2. So we can see the relationship between the harmonics 1 and 2 and the tuning theory and understanding of intervals. Alright, so let's have a little demo. So let's have a B flat horn. Here we go. So harmonics 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, 8, horn and A, easy, same intervals. Horn and A flat. And so on, right through the horns, okay? In the fundamentals. So the fundamental is a little harder to produce on the, on the long tubes and um, even the 16th harmonic needs quite a bit of preparation, doesn't it? It's playable, we can compose with it. The octave, it might be better in some circumstances to slur or go louder in volume up to the 16th harmonic or bridge uh, an octave leap, 8 to 16, with another pitch. And certainly on the shorter tubes, you'd seriously consider whether to use that 16th harmonic or not. All right? So, anyhow, look, the instruments that can only play harmonics 1 and 2 have a limited use. There are such instruments. And uh, I've got a couple of blog entries if you want to know, know more about those instruments. And you can, I've put a link to that, those blogs, which is on my website. You can uh, see that in the text below the video. Now, so let's move on, find out what else we can do with the horn that really sits within um, tuning understanding, what are the harmonics we've got. So, instruments that can play harmonics two and three have an interval resembling the perfect fifth. You might say, well, this is a perfect fifth. Yes, it is. 
But on the standard double horn, uh, it's pretty decent quality. Right on a good double horn, most relations between harmonics 2 and 3, 4 and 6, 6 and 12, or 6 and, uh, no, not 6 and 12, 8 and 12, sorry. 6 and 9 are remarkably good fifths. Now, however, test yourself out. As you know, playing with another horn player, the degree of tolerance for this perfect fifth or to tune it or mistune it, the degree of tolerance is really, really fine indeed. So, now, if we're using these perfect fifths, we can put them together in such a way as to get all the medieval modes. For instance, let's say we start on a C for us, on the F horn. And go up a fifth, harmonics four, six. Right, so C and G. Now, let's go down a fifth. So I did this on the B flat horn, harmonics three and two. Two. So C and an F. Now let's go up the other way. Now G D, right? Harmonic six and nine. Easy to produce on the horn. Now let's go down the other way. So and now tune that F on the first horn of the F horn. Now we've got F and B flat. So what have we got now? A C and a G and a D and an F and a B flat. So if we go another fifth higher, like that, we get up to an A. So I swapped the horns to make it work nicely. Tune those two as close as possible. And then we get the A. We're missing one note in a mode, seven note mode. So let's go down. To the E flat. Now we've got, we can put these notes in any order. And um, we'll have all the modes. But how, if C is the starting point, we've got the Dorian mode, haven't we? We can just put all those notes within one octave. And there we have the Dorian mode. A string of perfect fifths. Uh, just for your interest, I slightly pulled the first slide here and the B flat out a little bit to make that um, E flat and the B flat sit terrifically. So we can check it by playing the C on the F horn and the C on the first valve of the F horn or the E flat horn. And there we have it fits nicely, all right? Now look, there's a, a really interesting microtone. It's called the Pythagorean comma. And this is completely possible to play using two horns or two horn players, right? It's, look, it's not the most accessible microtone on the horn. I'll explore that next time, next episode. The comma brought about through a spiral of perfect fifths is important and interesting. This one, the Pythagorean comma, is the small interval between the notes that are 12 fifths apart when played next to each other in the same interval space.
So now the G sharp and the A flat are different pitches. This is because every perfect fifth is a little wider than the standard fifth on a standardly tuned keyboard. All right? The keyboard will be tuned in 12 tone equal temperament. A useful way to measure pitch distance is the cent, where 100 cents equals a semitone, 200 a tone, 700 a perfect fifth, 1200 an octave. So fifth on the piano on a standardly tuned keyboard is 700 cents, but on when the fifths are played pure and true like the harmonics real harmonics will then the fifth is 1.95 cents wider so 701.95 cents look round it out it's simpler 702 cents all right straightforward two cents difference roughly right so you accumulate that around fifths right d to a to e to b to F sharp, to C sharp, to G sharp, to D sharp, to A sharp, to E sharp, B sharp, to F double sharp, and C double sharp. Now this C double sharp is 24 cents higher than if you'd gone up seven octaves in Ds. D to D to D to D to D to D to D. And same going the other way. Go down D to G to C to F, to B flat, to E flat, to A flat, to D flat, to G flat, to C flat, to F flat, to B double flat, and to E double flat. So that E double flat will be lower than the original D. And this is the Pythagorean comma, All right, that difference. And the demo I played earlier shows you how you can do it by going D up through to G sharp and then down to A flat. So the A flat and the G sharp are different, different by a Pythagorean comma. All right. So the other thing, just to mention uh, again briefly, is the retuning of the slides. Just a tiny bit for Pythagorean tuning uh, makes it so when we are starting on C is, is the um, reference pitch or the tonic. Then I adjusted the first slide of the F and the B flat horn a little bit. Now when I was playing the demos with a, G, a, a, D, a D on the horn, I played it on third valve. And then just slightly tuned the, the second slide in a bit. To make the B high enough. Or bright enough all right and then same with the f horn can be same pitch maybe that one would have gone in a little bit as well and we got all those all right nicely and easily and otherwise if you start on one and two which is slightly sharp combination of valves then it makes it much harder the B sounds flat. It is flat to the D. All right. So there's always ways, if you're doing Pythagorean tuning, to shift the slides around in subtle ways to make it all work. All right. And this feature of shifting the vowel slides is very important when we get into. Um, using uh, other harmonics, higher harmonics, and shifting valve slides around to match them can be very interesting indeed. <laughs>